video covers the human reproductive cycle, one of the first things to note is the beautiful complexity of the female reproductive ovarian and uterine cycle. We've got a lot to cover here. The boys are down here in the corner. They're a little bit more simple because they don't really have to release one gamete a month. They can kind of round, so to speak, create a huge amount, and that's close enough. Females have to go through a lot more control in order to release just one oocyte or one gamete or one sex cell per month. Let's start to break down this complexity a little bit by showing what we got here. First of all, down at the bottom are the days of the female sexual cycle, which is usually around 28 days, but it can vary considerably up to something like 45 days or down to as low as 20 days. Along here I have several cartoons or simple figures of the different oocytes or follicular stages. So the oocyte is the egg in the middle, and the whole structure is called the follicle. And then I have real pictures of the same structures as well. I also have the four main hormones involved. Those are luteinizing hormone, here is abbreviated as LH, follicle stimulating hormone, abbreviated as FSH, estradiol or estrogen, and then I have progesterone too. And I have concentrations for those listed on the graph if you'd like to figure out those concentrations. LH and FSH are released by the anterior pituitary glands under stimulation by the hypothalamus by gonadotropin releasing hormone. Both estrogen or estradiol and progesterone are released by the ovary itself initially by the developing oocytes and later by the cells that surround the oocyte called the follicle cells. And these cells will go further into something called the corpus luteum, which we'll discuss later. And those release a lot of estrogen and progesterone as well. At the very bottom is a little pictograph or a little cartoon again of the changes that are going to occur in the uterine lining. Note that the timing of the development of the oocyte is perfectly timed to the development of the uterine lining. It generally takes about six to eight days after ovulation for the oocyte to actually reach the uterus. And so right after ovulation, about six to eight days, the uterine lining is at its thickest and is most ready to receive the oocyte. One last thing before we go through each of the individual stages, I wanted to show this graph down here because I found this kind of interesting. This is the number of oogonia. These are very early developed oocytes. In the womb, while the female is still in the womb herself, she will create up to seven million oogonia. And that's at about six months development. At the time of birth, that's down to a little over two million. And at the time of reproductive age, around 10, there's only about 400,000 oogonia left. And those are going to reduce, those are going to go down as we go throughout the years, because each month you're going to choose a few of those follicles, and those are going to develop into an oocyte that can be fertilized in order to complete reproduction. Let's now go through the sexual cycle and point out several of the landmarks that occur. We're going to start here at day zero. I just point out that this is set by convention as the beginning of the monthly cycle because it's got an easily visible landmark and that is the presence of menstruation. So the beginning of the female sexual cycle is set at the beginning of the menstrual cycle because it's an easily definable landmark. One thing you can note is we've kind of already started a rise in follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone over here towards the end of the cycle. So we're going to continue to have FSH and LH rise. And those are being stimulated by the hypothalamus through the anterior pituitary. So the hypothalamus releases something called gonadotropin releasing hormone, which stimulates the anterior pituitary to release follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. These two hormones then begin to cause several follicles from 6 to 12 follicles to accelerate their growth. This early stage is dominated by follicle stimulating hormone and that makes sense because we're actually stimulating a follicle. And so FSH is a little bit higher than luteinizing hormone. As the egg develops, it begins to release its own estrogen. So estrogen levels begin to rise and that causes a rapid expansion of the antrum. The antrum is the vacuole or the empty space around the actual oocyte and you can see it a little bit better here. At this stage, one of the follicles begins to outgrow the other follicles. So remember, we started with something like 6 to 12 primary follicles. One begins to win, and when it begins to win, it starts releasing enough estrogen on its own in order to support its continued growth. So you can see that estrogen is on the rise. It's dominated by one particular follicle, and it's releasing enough estrogen to report back to the anterior pituitary to stop releasing follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Once it does this, the FSH and the LH go away, and that prevents the other follicles from continuing to grow. Metaphorically, it reminds me of a cowbird or a cuckoo, which are birds that will lay their eggs in another bird's nest, and the cuckoo or the cowbird turns out to be bigger than the other birds in the nest, and it'll kick them out of the nest. In this case, because you only really want one follicle being released at a time, so once one grows big enough to shut off the FSH and LH for the other eggs, they're going to wither away something called involution, and we're going to sustain that one dominant follicle. About two days before ovulation, 
this LH and FSH that were going down are going to reverse course. So LH is going to start to rise, and as the name suggests, we're starting to enter something called the luteum phase. And that's named after, after the egg is gone, we develop something called the corpus luteum. And so development of the corpus luteum begins with the rise of luteinizing hormone. And so beginning of luteinization begins with the rise in luteinizing hormone. This is also going to be the major stimulus for ovulation, for the egg actually being released. Because if there's no luteinizing hormone, there is no ovulation. Follicle stimulating hormone is on the rise as well, but not nearly as much as luteinizing hormone. As LH hits its peak, cells in the follicle around the actual oocyte begin to release lysozyme, also releases prostaglandins that cause swelling in the oocytes. Those two are going to combine to actually push the egg out of the oocyte in ovulation. Here's a picture of that here. In the first hours after ovulation, the remaining cells that surrounded the oocyte change rapidly, and they develop into something called the corpus luteum. And this is fairly significant, and the significance of, this, of the size of the corpus luteum is often lost in diagrams shown in textbooks. The corpus luteum can take on almost half the size of the ovary. In this case, in this picture, it's actually outside the ovary, but you can see the rather large size. And the reason it's this large is it's taking in huge amounts of lipids, which is also making it turn yellow. The reason it's taking in lipids is because lipids are the precursor for estrogen and progesterone. So again, this is called the corpus luteum. Another thing to show on this graph is now that we have this corpus luteum, we're starting to increase our release of progesterone and estrogen. And that increase in progesterone actually causes an increase in body temperature of around 0 0.5 degrees Fahrenheit. So one of the ways that you can find out when you are ovulating and when you're becoming pregnant is to measure your body temperature and your body temperature will raise a half degree as you're ovulating, which is still sufficient time for fertilization because that oocyte will survive for at least another 24 hours, although that will cut it a little close. Probably an even better method now, though, is to use urine tests, urinalysis, that tests for luteinizing hormone. So this spike in luteinizing hormone causes an increase in LH in the urine, and that can be detected prior to ovulation, and so reproduction can be attempted earlier on rather than waiting for the temperature change. Moving on then, the corpus luteum begins to secrete large amounts of progesterone and estrogen, and that's why we're going up rapidly. These are going to feed back to the anterior pituitary. It's going to cause a decline in the release of follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So those hormones begin to decline. Now I'll say just briefly that if there's actual fertilization of the egg, upon implantation, the egg will report back to the corpus luteum with a hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG. And if the corpus luteum receives that signal, that HCG, it'll continue to develop and maintain these levels of progesterone and estrogen throughout the pregnancy right up until birth. If the egg is not fertilized, then the levels of progesterone and estrogen begin to decline as the corpus luteum degenerates. Once it degenerates, it starts releasing less and less progesterone and less and less estrogen, and that causes FSH and LH to escape the inhibition caused by progesterone and estrogen inhibiting the anterior pituitary. So once progesterone and estrogen go down, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone can start to rise again, and that begins the cycle all over again. So let's go down here to the male reproductive cycle then, which is fairly simple. It uses the same hormones, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, stimulates the pituitary to release follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And those act on two separate cells, but they do come back together. Luteinizing hormone stimulates what's called a Leydig cell to make testosterone. Follicle-stimulating hormone stimulates something called a Sertoli cell, which produces androgen-binding protein. Androgen-binding protein catches testosterone as it circulates by through the blood and allows it to concentrate inside the Leydig cells. And this concentrated testosterone allows testosterone to promote sperm development, called spermatogenesis. So you can insert your own little joke here about how much more simple the male reproductive system is, but I really find the female reproductive system amazingly complex. Just looking at these lines of hormones going up and down and how estrogen is inhibiting FSA, and then it causes this increase in luteinizing hormone and progesterone goes up and estrogen goes up, and then they go back down and allow FSH and LH to go back up. It's really just a wonderful example of the complexity of the endocrine system. So thank you.